So a lot of this will be redundant uh, just because we're going to be talking about prone <clears throat> uh, inner body fusions, but in many ways to skin a cat, posterior approaches are very familiar to us. Um, single position, you don't have to reposition, and disadvantages include a smaller inner dev body device and possibly less correction. Lateral and anterior fusions allow for larger inner body devices, but you have to work around great vessels, unfamiliar anatomy, you may need multiple positions. And so then it's like the T lift is where we start, and then like, oh, it's A lift, and then it's like lateral, right? And that was like prone lateral is like the new thing, right? Um, so single position surgery, prone lateral fusion, corpectomy, and then some of the lessons that I've learned so far, and I will apologize to Dr. Park in advance because he was upset about his one A-lift cage, so he hasn't seen anything yet. Um, so this is a position we're used to for, for lateral, right? Lateral decubitus, and then um, positioning to access the disc space, the lumbar plexus, things we gotta worry about, worry, look out for, docking the cage, doing the discectomy, um, some of the approach if you're in the lateral position. Prone position has been discussed, uh, induces more lower doses. The psoas muscle may move more posteriorly and that may shift the lumbar plexus. Um, but um, it allows for simultaneous positioning and um, inner body work and you can do both inner body and posterior work at the same time. Uh, this is an example <clears throat> of myself and the resident. So I'm doing the inner body work laterally the resident is using NAV and doing the posterior osteotomies at the same time. So you can be, you know, potentially twice as efficient as you can do both parts of the surgery at the same time. Again, advantages uh, for a prone surgery, less obstruction, induce lower doses, you may move the lumbar plexus. Disadvantages, I think, are operator comfort, ergonomics. Um, the psoas muscle tends to be a little tighter, so you have to work around that. Longer reach, and um, that is affected by BMI. So when you do it like in a lateral decubitus, the the belly and all this stuff moves anteriorly, so you kind of recreate the patient's waist or their hip. And when they're prone, all that tissue just spreads out wider. And so if the patient has a bigger BMI, they just get spread out, and so you have a longer reach, in my experience. Um, so this is kind of the progression that I took to get to the first prone lateral case. I would definitely not recommend this progression. Um, when I was a resident, we didn't do like T-lifts, and I, I definitely didn't do any laterals. And then when I was a fellow, we did like a fair amount of laterals and one prone lateral case. And then as an attending, I had done one lateral decubitus case. And then my next case in this was like a prone lateral corpectomy. So went from zero to 100 very, very quickly. So it was like my first year, maybe my second year in practice, and the resident calls me and says, hey, we got this patient. She was a trauma. She had a burst fracture. And now the instrumentation is sticking out her back. And I was like, oh, okay, like X, Y, or Z. And I was like, why is her instrumentation sticking out of her back? And so this is the photo she sent, they sent me of the patient. And if you can see, that's the, that's the rod in the second picture right there. So I was like, this is, this is awesome. This is what her x-rays look like. Um, her neurologic status from the accident was pretty devastated, so she's a paraplegic. And so, you know, very early in my career, I'm like, what do I do? Do I go from the back? Do I have to go from the front? Do I have to go from the front of the back? She had a lot of trauma psychologically from her first surgery, and she was really resistant to doing multiple surgeries at the same time. She already needed, like, a large kind of reconstructive procedure for her back because of the instrumentation. And um, I thought I could maybe do it, like a prone lateral corpectomy. Don't ask me why I thought I could do that. Um, and then during the case, it was one of those situations where the resonance kind of, like, you know, gave you some encouragement, and we kind of worked through it. So um, this is her progression. So this is what it looked like when she first had her surgery done. And you can notice that she has a compression deformity at um, the lower instrumented um, segment. So they decided to stop there. It was done in an outside hospital. And then this is what the CT looked like. She's trying to form some bridging bone. And then this is what it looked like when we did it. So I did it open. We removed the, post, the inferior instrumentation. Um, put in a cage after we did the axis aside into the corpectomy. And then this is what it looks like. Sorry, Paul, I know it looks awful. And then um, these are some of the post-op photos, like kind of long-term. So we got a very good correction and neurologic st status was stable and uh, they were able to close the wound in the back and all that stuff. Um, so the way I look at the procedure, so it's positioning, so the patient's prone. I initially do the posterior instrumentation first and then whatever decompression I need to do first and then I do the lateral part. I do this almost exclusively with navigation. I can't remember the last time I did it with floor-based. 
Um, on, when I dock, um, I don't dock in the disk space first because I'm worried about if I dock in the disk space and I expand the retractor, I'm going to avulse the segmental. And finding the segmental is crucial to this because it's crossing the middle of the vertebral body. If you don't find it, um, you're going to have a really bad day. And actually, in that one case, I found the first segmental, ligated it, and then when I was doing the, the far wall of the corpectomy, I found the other contra the contralateral segmental and had a ton of bleeding, so it's not a fun time. Um, then put in the cage. Uh, so in this picture, I'm just trying to show, I think it's better if the Jackson table is on the highest peg versus the lowest peg, which is what this picture shows. And then this is just standard positioning for a prone. Um, I've done it with uh, coronal benders for the patient positioners. I think they can be helpful. I've done it without it as well. My, the, in my opinion, the biggest advantage is sometimes it helps avoid taking a rib if you need to, but it also helps recreate that, that waist. So sometimes it reaches a little bit shorter if you position them. And then the question is, do you sit? Do you stand? What do you do? Um, I do a combination of both. So I'll sit and stand for various parts of the surgery. Um, if you use NAB, I think it's really helpful because what it allows you to do is <coughs> rotate the bed away. So when you're doing um, like a prone lateral or any lateral, you want to be really orthogonal to the disc space. And when you roll the patient, because it's easier to see that way, but you're not using NAV, your tendency is to go straight across. But the patient's rotated, that's you know, headed to like the nerve root potentially, and you always have to kind of reorient yourself downward. If you're doing the disc work or the corpectomy work with navigation, it always is gonna keep you true, because as you put it, the instrument in, you can see on the navigation what your trajectory is like, and that helps, you keep, you, helps keep you honest. Um, this is the setup. Um, I think the lessons I've learned is, it's hard to see, but the retractor for the arm is in the armpit of the patient, so it's rostral. And then this one was one of the early ones, and the navigation frame is contralateral, because I thought that would be easier. Um, I thought it'd be less in the way of trying to do all the work. It's better, like Dr. Chan said, if you put it ipsilateral, because the field of view for the navigation is easier, and it's just, there's less visual obstruction to that. Um, and again, the patient's rolled. I'm sitting for this particular portion of the case. Um, I won't belabor the parts of like accessing it, because we kind of have been over it with it, everybody. But this is the view with a corpectomy, and I've pointed out the segmental artery, which is very important to find early in the case, and then the muscular branch of the psoas. So um, if you see something like this, you know, like it, the segmental, obviously, but if you stimulate this nerve branch, the, the leg's gonna go crazy. It's gonna jump off the table if you're at like two, right? Never mind eight. And you're gonna be like, well, is, there, is this a femoral nerve? And the, your neuromonitoring will say no. Like, well, the patient's moving like crazy. So what that means is you're probably at, there are two possibilities. One is they're not accurately uh, monitoring the femoral nerve, which is probably unlikely, especially if you know the technologies and you worked with them a lot. The second possibility is that this is a muscular branch, the psoas. So it's gonna move the psoas muscle, but not activate the rest of the femoral nerve. And it's a judgment call a little bit whether or not you think it's really a branch of the femoral nerve or just a branch of the psoas a little bit. You have to know, keep in mind what level you are in the spine, things like that. But if you don't trust the monitoring, I would just keep that in mind as a possibility. Um, for the corpectomy, I plan it with NAV. And basically what I do is I have navigated osteotomes and I just stitch across where I think the cut needs to be, um, dorsal and ventral. And then I use large bony run drawers and then pull out the chunks of the bone. Um, for the corpectomy. Uh, so these are some uh, fluoroscopic x-rays of a corpectomy cage. The, the point of this is that the retractors are quite bulky and sometimes you can't see it very well. And so, and a lot of the times when I take the retract, when I put the cage in, I think it looks okay. I take the retractor out and it's um, angled a funny way. And so I just get ready that I may have to re-engage the cage with the um, inserter reposition it, and then re-expand um, re it. Uh, this is one of the patients we did recently. So he had a L1, an old L1 compression fracture, um, axial back pain, some like neurogenic claudication symptoms. He had a previous decompression as well, myself and a partner. And so we did a corpectomy, single level, to try to correct his deformity. Um, he also had unit rods. So in this situation, I didn't do, this is all perk screws. I didn't do really any osteotomies in the back. This is all corpectomy work basically. And after I had done the discectomies and the corpectomies, I had passed the rods to try to correct the deformity. And then after the deformity was corrected, I put the cage in. Um, I find that workflow to be a little bit better um, because the other picture that I showed this one, I don't think I did a good job doing the discectomies because 
he was so unstable from the burst fracture. As I expanded the corpectomy, just like kept on pushing everything away. I didn't do a good discectomy. So I think if I had locked him down first, finished the discectomy, I probably would have gotten better end plate coverage. Um, so that's what this looked like at the end of that, once the retractors were out. Um, so again, these are his pre-op films. Um, these are his post-op films. And then these are the stab incisions on the side. The lateral incision is a little bit bigger than if you're doing a single level prone lateral. It's about the size if you're going to do a two or three level uh, prone lateral incision. And then in the back, we just did his perk screws. Um, you can decompress the canal directly. Um, I, this was uh, one of the other cases I did. I don't think I would do it again, quite frankly. It was very nerve wracking for me, um, but it can be done. So we have a case series of seven patients, multiple indications, most likely, most commonly trauma. Um, in my opinion, the contraindication would be a large BMI, just again for reach more than anything. Um, these are the patient characteristics. Um, these are the levels that were instrumented and um, the outcomes. And then here's some post-operative films. And basically, it's a, it's a progression from the first case to the last case. And um, the first cases, we didn't have adequate instrumentation in terms of cages because there were shorter end plates, they didn't have as good coverage. Their tractor systems have evolved and things like that. And so <clears throat> I like to think in general, as the cases have progressed, I've become a better surgeon, both in terms of cage placement and efficiency. Um, but I think the workflow in terms of, oh, sorry. Um, so complications, right? So abdominal viscera, uh, lumbo, oops, lumbosacral plexus. So this is one of my patients. This is the worst hematoma I've ever seen. So the, the residents called me and said like, there's a bad hematoma. He did fine, but he just had some rib pain from the exposure. My best guess is he had some residual bleeding from the segmental, which I had to ligate several times. But this bruise lasted for several weeks, but he's doing okay now. Um, infection, neurologic injury. Um, everybody worries about a femoral nerve palsy. Um, my other practice is like peripheral nerve surgery. If you have a patient with a femoral nerve palsy from this approach, we, we can fix that actually with like nerve transfer. So if you know anybody, like let me know, and I will find somebody in your area who can help with that. Um, and then my, the patients that I think are ideal are uh, smaller patients, just a smaller BMI, again, the reach, L1 to 3 to start. I've done an L4. It's not very fun. Um, base patients, they don't need direct decompression. Um, so those are the patients that I think are ideal for it, and I'm happy to take any questions. So Kevin, that's a great talk, and it's nice to see your, your progression because, you know, you were a fellow with us at Michigan, and seeing how far you've gotten is, is, in, is incredible, honestly. So, um, and I like the workflow. Like, you, you put in the cage after you put the rods in there. Um, so two questions that I had. So I saw, I saw that you said you did L4. Have you gone above L1? Um, and then the second question is, have you ever uh, put in the cage and then, you know, expanded a little bit and then put the rod and then expanded the cage all the way? Like, would that work too? So it's, I don't think I've, I have one, I may try to do a T12, um, maybe, but no, I've not done above L1. And there's no reason you couldn't do that with the cage and rod workflow. So you definitely could. Um, it's been more typical where I pass a rod first and then expand the, oh, I see. So sometimes, um, you have to re, you have to unlock the rod and relock it after the cage has expanded. But it's not. I don't like to do where it's like I do one, then I do another, then I do one and do another. So after the cage has expanded to a reasonable height, I will unloosen and then retighten just to make sure there's not too much tension in the screws. Kevin, um, really enjoyed your talk, um, and I think you're really moving the needle along here. So uh, congratulations. Um, I have a quick question in terms of more in workflow. Um, <laughs> You know, when you do the lateral approach, it can be very disorienting. Uh, and I've been going back and forward with that, either kind of dissecting both discs out and then connecting the dots versus docking right in the middle. Yeah. Can you take us through it? So right now, so mentally, so we are looking at the source fascia. Yeah. What is going to be your next step? Yeah, so I think, um, for me, this is where Navrily is helpful, right? So if you're using NAV for the dilator, so I think if you if, if I was going to do it with fluorobase, I would dock in the disc space first, pick one, okay. and then expand the retractor to the other one. If I were to do it that way, though, I would dock very superficially, maybe even over the psoas fascia and expand it. Because again, the, the most critical part is to find the segmental. Yeah. So if you, if you rip the segmental or you cut it by accident, 
you're just going to see blood and it's very hard to control. And then if you're not deep enough in the psoas fascia, like let's say you're at L4, you're going to be worried about the plexus because you don't want a bobe or bipolar where the plexus might be. So that's why I like to dock in the middle of the vertebral body. I, I don't use a K-wire, so I don't put a K-wire first and then dilate over that. So you open the fascia yep. and then you split the muscle? Correct. And then you find the segmental in there? Correct. Yep. Uh, so you really look for it. Do you have any tricks in how to, uh, what is your technique to find it the best to localize it? Do you have any landmarks? Yeah. Because um, sometimes it can be hard to. Yeah, I think so. If it's if it's a compress like if it's a compression fracture, it, the anatomy is all off. You like you might not even see it just because it might be shifted. Um, if it's normal vertebral body or it's a fracture where it's not so compressed, I start in the middle and basically what I do is I work uh, ventral dorsal with um, a kidner, mm -hmm. just to be gentle with the dissection and try to localize it that way. Okay. So you do plant dissection through the muscle. So then you have found the segmental. Um, you. You like it. Mm -hmm. What is your next step? Do you sort of put a, do you dock your retract in there? Or yeah. Do you do fix it in the middle, like there's a pin or like a oh. gym, sh do you um, put a shim in there? And then so the shims are hard because they don't always go through the bone. If mm -hmm. I can, I'll try to retract it with the, um, the retractor blades. And also depends on the system, right? Mm -hmm. So the system that I showed, uh, this is the Alpha Tech system, but it opens uh, rostral caudal, not um, dorsal ventral, which uh, their other system does. And then a lot of these other systems are uh, a triplay system. So you just have to work with the constraints of like what they allow you to do. Okay. Um, after the psoas, and if I try to retract as much of the psoas as possible, sometimes you just can't because it's, you know, if it's a younger patient, it's just going to be kind of thick and you have to work around it. After the psoas is, after the dilator is docked, and I'm relatively happy with the position. By the way, that takes, in my opinion, that's the longest part of the procedure. It's getting the retractor in the best position. That's probably the part I spend the most time on. Because if the retractor is not in a good position, the whole time you're going to be fighting with it, and then your, your results are going to not be as good. Yeah. So in this case that I showed with the, the L1 compression deformity, the docking took 30 or 45 minutes, and the actual corpectomy part took like 15. Right? Because that, that part's like kind of easy, because you just stitch the osteo, tell them apart, and then you take out the bone, and then you, that's it. Right? So after the dilator and the dock is in a position I like, then I do the discectomies. Um, above and below, um, good end plate prep. And then I do the disgust, the corpectomy, and then um, then we place the cage. You know, the the one of the biggest problems with corpectomies of the thoracolumbar junction, particularly L one, is, you know, when you put your retractor and um, you don't orient it correctly, the 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 inferior part of the uh, blade is actually too um, dorsal. So a lot of times when you put the corpectomy cage in, it's more inferior on the downside. Yeah. So I. You know that what I do with nav um, is like you know the midpoint of the the blades. I just put it right down and see if I'm at the midpoint of the disc. And often you're rotating the retractor like 40 degrees, like um, clockwise. Because you're because you're hitting the rib. Yeah. Well, no, you're too dorsal. Like okay. you're, it's not a flat plane. The the spine's like this, so yeah. you have to rotate mm -hmm. it. And that way the cage, you know, the inferior part of the cage isn't too dorsal. I, but uh, I mean those are. Yeah, it's a good picture, and what you showed was actually uh, uh, very insightful. All right, any other questions? Uh, well, thanks, Kevin. Uh, I think we'll go to lunch, and then we have the one more.